This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I am joined by my co-host, my brosif, Joshua Ryan Rusin. Mr. Rusin, how are you doing this morning? Gino, doing well. Super excited to be down here in Florida, uh, staying with you and the family, and, and also excited about as we're growing and scaling, uh, building a business, right? So creating a system, operating a system, and then delegating it. Uh, this way, the organizational chart isn't just you, me, you, me. We have people who are even better at these tasks helping us out and making things happen. Gino, what are you excited about? Well, let's, let me piggyback off of that thought. And it comes down to multifamily real estate also. And our guest today is going through that, buying smaller properties, probably doing it himself, the I'm a mentality. And we need to do that when we first start out because we need to learn. But as we learn to grow, think of multifamily as a business where you can scale and start delegating it. And I think that's the hardest thing for investors when they start out with. They think they have to do everything. And when you start in business, you do in the beginning, bootstrapping it. But as you get bigger, start implementing those systems in your business, Josh. Love that. And one thing there is you bring up a good point. Most entrepreneurs get stuck in that solopreneur phase, right? They become a technician working in the business rather than on it. And that's the importance of scaling and having systems and standard operating procedures. So I completely agree. All right. Speaking of today's guests, we have... Steve Matrano. So he's a graduate of the University of Massachusetts, a year and a bachelor's degree in fine arts, specializing in graphic design and animation. Steve began a career in the television industry, working for multiple news stations around New England. His hard work and dedication earned him seven Emmy Awards in a variety of categories. In 2017, Steve discovered he also had a passion for real estate investing, specifically in the multifamily space. After spending two years educating himself, Steve purchased three multifamily properties in the Boston area, totaling 12 units in just over 12 months. His plans are to scale his portfolio over the next few years with the intention of living a financially free life with his friends and family. Welcome to the show, Steve. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me on. Really excited to be here. Yeah. So, Steve, let, let's back it up a little bit. So, you go into graphic arts and design and animation. How, how did that land you into the TV world? So I, I actually got pretty lucky there. Um, I had a roommate in college who, you know, my best friend from home uh, ended up being my roommate. And he happened to be dating a girl whose mother worked at a TV station in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. So he was also a design major and he got a job working there um, after he graduated. And luckily, um, a year later, my senior year, he asked me if I wanted a job and uh, I was like, yeah, sure. And then when he told me the hours, it was uh, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night till, till uh, I think it was 3 p.m. to midnight. And as you know, in college, I mean, those are the, the party nights. So I had a, really had to think about it. But, you know, I sucked it up. I did it. Um, and, you know, it was obviously the best decision I ever made, uh, sacrificing those nights. So, because, you know, I was one of the only kids – in my graduating class that had a design job and that was making money, you know, all my roommates were poor. And so it was, uh, it was definitely, it was definitely worth it. So Josh, Mr. metrano has got a vowel last name. He, he ends in O like, like Gino, right. And Barbaro, we have a lot of similarities. On the, and I really want to dive into, you know, his background because he has immigrant parents. They are in multifamily. And they have a lot of limiting beliefs like my parents did. So, Steve, let's dive into, you know, your parents, your background, why real estate and how you want to, like, differentiate yourselves from what your parents are doing in the real estate space. Yeah, so both of my parents came here with nothing. Um, they came here when, when they were teenagers. Uh, my mother's one of 12. My father's one of nine. So two huge families coming over from Italy. Um, my father and his brothers, you know, they, they try to think of something that they could do um, that people would always need in life. So they all became hairdressers, right? So they opened a salon. All I, actually, I think all nine of them got their hair their hairdresser license. Um, so, but they all became hairdressers. They opened a salon. They opened a couple of salons. Um, and after a few years, they I just maybe it wasn't enough. I don't know. So they started buying properties. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know where they learned it from, but they just over the years just kept buying more and more and more. And you know 
multifamily, retail, whatever it was. Um, so, you know, I was introduced to it at a very young age. I remember on the weekends, you know, most kids were going to amusement parks, going to the zoo, you know, my parents were taking us to, my father was taking us to apartments while he fixed things. You know, I'm in these strangers' apartments. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. You know, me and my sister are running around touching everyone's stuff. And he's like, no, 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 don't touch that. My mother's there cleaning the place, you know? So we was just, at a, at a very young age, I was uh, introduced to it. And I didn't, re I didn't know what, we, what it was or, or how powerful it was, you know? Because it was just never explained to us. I knew that, you know, we always had you know, nicer things, nicer cars, because my father had these properties that brought in money, but it just, you know, I, it, it didn't really click uh, until I got older and my wife and I, you know, had some, some good jobs and we're like, what can we do with our money? You know, mm -hmm. instead of just saving it, what can we do with it? So I, I thought about real estate. I st actually started, it was something I knew I'd always do eventually, mm -hmm. but um, I really started looking into it and started reading books and listening to podcasts. And once I really understood how powerful it was, I was like, this is what we have to do. You know, there's just no other way. Steve, let's talk about that. You mentioned, you know, saving your way to wealth. Talk to me a little bit about what you saw the advantages of investing your way to wealth and growing your income rather than trying to save every penny and get there. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I mean, my wife and I both have great jobs, but neither one of us are going to be CEOs of, of companies. You know, it's just it's, neither one of us even want to do that. You know, um, our jobs are demanding enough and stressful enough that, you know, it's great when you get paid. But now that we both, you know, now that we have kids, it's, it's everything changed. You know, I mean, we both felt like being at work every day for eight, nine, 10 hours, we're missing out on so much of our kids' lives mm -hmm. that we just figured there has to be another way. So once we, we un, you know, learn what real estate could do, you know, the, the idea of just saving money and, you know, once you learn what a 401k is really about and how it's not really going to get you to where you want to be, and especially to have to wait 65 years to cash it out, like it just, none of it makes sense, you know? So mm -hmm. We just needed something that could get us there faster and hopefully allow us to retire early and, and actually enjoy our lives instead of traveling when we're 65 and, you know, tired and, and I don't want to say old because my parents are in their 60s, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. So, Steve, let me ask you a question. Did you feel as you were growing up that that's what everybody did? Because when I was eight years old, I'd go to the restaurant with my dad and I thought everyone went to work with their dad at the restaurant so was it like you going to work with your dad in an apartment and you thought that's what everybody does was that your paradigm when you're growing up yeah and the funny thing is is my mom actually had a restaurant uh, when i was growing up as well which would happen to be right next door to my dad's salon so after school i'd walk there every day and i'd be sitting at the restaurant while my mother worked you know i'd run over to my dad's salon get a haircut go back to my mom's restaurant eat you know so it was just, that was what we did you know and uh, mm -hmm. like on the weekends we'd go We'd go to Costco to go shopping for the restaurant, you know, like we just did things that normal people didn't do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's what I that's all I knew was to spend time at my parents businesses. Um, but the main thing was, is my father was like, you know, my father didn't know any better. That's all he knew. So he thought a life of getting good grades, going to college, getting a secure job was better than what he was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but he never did it. So now that I'm doing it. And I'm, you know, like you always say, is a job really secure? You know, it's, it's not. I mean, my company was just sold uh, in December and who knows what that means? I mean, my job could be gone today. You know, mm -hmm. I can walk into work and they can say, sorry. So is it secure? No, you know, it's, I don't think it's a better option. You know, I, I think it depends on, uh, you know, how you perceive it, I guess. You know? mm -hmm. So it sounds like the pain point of you trading time for money, realizing that to scale the corporate ladder, you just consume more of your time. And it wasn't something you're willing to sacrifice the family. And then realizing also that you're at the mercy of the company is what led you to look more into real estate investing. Talk about why multifamily, why this niche, what about it, uh, everything. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it just seemed like multifamily was, was the, the best way to, to, scale quickly, um, to reach my goal faster. Um, you know, so it, it, it just seems like going in the single family space, I mean, not to knock it, but it's just going to take too long. I mean, my goal was a hundred units in six years, you know, to get a hundred single families just doesn't really, 
make sense for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I figured I could get there a lot quicker in multifamily. Uh, you know, I started small. I started with a couple of three families. Now I'm moving to six. Um, and hopefully I can double that or triple that on the next one, you know. Um, so it just seems like the opportunity and the scalability, you know, is, is just a lot more, a lot po more possible with multifamily for me. So what prompted you to join the Jake and Gino community? And what, what have you gotten out of the community since you joined? So, you know, I, I felt like I got to a point where I, I learned a lot. Um, I learned enough to buy a couple of properties, but I felt like I peaked um, on my own, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and I, I would see a lot of the students um, closing deals. I'd see you guys posting it online. I'm like, you know, I need mentors and I need coaches and I need people like this who are going to help push me um, to take it to the next level, you know, because it, it's, you can learn a lot from books and podcasts, but at least for me, I learn by doing and, you know, whether I make mistakes or whether I fail, like that's how I, I learn the best. Um, so, you know, I knew joining the community was just going to be an advantage uh, and, and help push me and guide me, and, you know, I, to know that I had the support of the community when I needed it, you know. And, and most importantly, we talked offline, that word accountability. Talk about that word accountability and even the group itself and even the friendships and the networks. I think that's what we get when we join a like-minded community. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm the definition of an introvert. I don't network. I don't talk to people. Um, and so when I started learning about real estate and realizing that, you know, it is a mostly about networking and, and who you know and who you meet. Uh, I felt like I had to put myself in these uncomfortable situations in order to grow. Um, and so, you know, I, I went to the multifamily mastery three in Orlando in October and I purposely went by myself because I knew if I went with friends, I was just going to click, you know, cling to my friends and not meet new people. So I went by myself. I met a bunch of great guys from, from the community, um, you know, and continue to talk to them after the conference um, went down to the buy right boot camp in January, you know, made it a point to go with them and, and, or meet them there and um, continue to just build a relationship with them. And now we're all traveling to Cincinnati and uh, Kentucky uh, this weekend. So to go look at some properties and talk to some uh, brokers and property managers and just kind of check out the market and see if there's anything there worth pursuing. So what would you recommend to people that are on the fence saying, you know what, I could probably go my, go on my own. Cause I'm an introvert like you. I would actually call, I would actually call ourselves ambiverts because it sounds like you're not an extrovert. You're not an introvert. You, when you need to make it happen, you make it happen. So what, what, what would you recommend to people starting in, in, in multifamily? If they want to get into multifamily, where would you tell them to start? Because obviously you had a base, but you weren't happy with that base. There's a lot of people out there that have no idea how to get into multifamily. So what would you recommend to them? Um, I, you know, you just got to do it. You, you know, you have to, you have to just suck it up. You have to commit. You have to realize that, you know, failing's not the worst thing in the world. You know, at the end of the day, you're talking about money and money. Yeah. It's great to have money, but you know, if you, if you go into a, a deal and it ends up not working out and you know, it's not the end of the world, mm -hmm. you can always, you can always make more money. You can I agree with that. Again, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. I, I, for a year, you know, I would go look at properties and I'd be like, is this the one, you know, am I going to make an offer? And, you know, you get that paralysis analysis paralysis where it's hard to pull the trigger, you know, but once you do, and once you take action, uh, there's no turning back, at least for me, you know, mm -hmm. I, when I pulled the trigger, it was like, that's it. Like mm -hmm. the hard part's over, you know, um, now I'm a landlord and now I'm dealing with the calls and stuff. And it's not as bad as, as I thought it was going to be. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, of course there are days that I don't want to go to my property and, and fix something or call somebody to fix something or meet someone there. But when you look at the amount of calls you get versus the, the times you don't, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. if it's like two, three calls a month and you're going 27 days with no calls. I mean, I just made a lot of money in those 27 days that those three days were nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. It's not about the money, but it's, it's a business. So at the end of the day, it is about the numbers and you know, so. I like that. So let's talk about that first deal. Cause it's important because it's, it's a big deal. It's a lot of money. 
Walk us through some of the mistakes and some of the pain points that you had. And what the great thing about it is you have a framework now. You've done a deal. You know what you're not going to do on your next deal. So what what were some of the challenges or some of the mistakes that you made after you purchased the deal or while you're going through due diligence or any any of those steps there? Yeah, so I was spoiled uh, with my first two deals. They were two small three families. Um, You know, day one, I was cash flowing had no issues the first few months, you know, it was great. I'm like, this is great. This is easy. You know, why isn't everyone doing this? Um, and then, you know, a year later, which was this past December, I bought, um, the six family where on paper it looked great. Um, it was a lot less than a building. I had put an offer in down the street. Um, you know, I'm talking half a million less and the numbers worked. I looked at the building, the building looked great, uh, compared to a lot of the other buildings I looked at, um, so for me, it was a no brainer, you know, I, I, I went forward with it. Um, and during due diligence, I, I made a, a little mistake, um, where the inspector did not have a ladder long enough to get to the roof. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of, you know, he recommended getting a roofer out there to look at it. And I was, you know, looking at the price of what it was going to cost. And I said, you know what, what are the chances the roof is going to go in the next six months to a year? You know, they're saying it's 15 years old. It's probably getting another five years left on it. Um, screw it. You know, let's just move forward with it. Time's running out. Um, and of course, the first month, uh, the tenant on the top floor has water pouring in through the ceiling. So, you know, huge mistake there, you know, but I learned, um, you know, the roofer came out, looked at it, wanted 27000 to repair the roof. Um, we didn't do it. We just did a patch job for, for 7000 but you know, day one, we're talking issues and I had a few other issues too, where, um, when I went to look at the property the first time it was fully occupied, um, went to the inspection. We had one empty apartment all of a sudden closed on December 5th. And when I got the rent roll, it went from 9,200 to 3,900. All of a sudden, there's three vacant apartments mm. that people move, you know, moved out December 1st. I was like, you got to be kidding me. Mm. So now I'm taking the building over 50% occupied. Um, roof problems. For the day I close, I'm walking through the building. And uh, there was a, the, one of the tenants that moved out was running a daycare in there. So the unit was trashed. Cockroaches everywhere. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Um, so, you know, pest control day one. Master key of the building, day one. Roof um, repairs, day one. Ceiling, I come home from the buy right boot camp. I get off the plane. I have a text message from my property manager. The unit on the first floor, the ceiling collapsed. So, uh, you know, you name it. This was, you talk about getting kicked in the teeth. I mean, this is it, you know? And, and part of me was like, what did I do? I made a huge mistake. But then the other part of me is like, this is the business. You know, this is what I signed up for. This is what's going to make me a better investor. Um, you know, I'm going through it. So at the same time, you know, I hate it, but at the same time, I actually like it because I'm getting the experience and the next one's just going to be better. You know, I'm just going to make a lot of you know, better decisions, more due diligence. And, um, you know, again, it's, I was spoiled with my first two. And so this is, you know, I'm really learning now. I love that. There's so much Josh to dive into. The first thing, everybody, Steve is still alive. He survived. And he's going to continue to survive because those problems that he's had in his first deal, the next deal he does, they're not really going to be problems. Cockroaches aren't problems because Steve doesn't live there. Steve can call a pest control company and and, and take care of that situation. Now on the leases, everybody, that's a, that's a challenging one because what you need to do is you need to do a lease audit, right? And you need to really look at all the leases and see how long they're, if they're month to month, there is more risk on that, right? Sometimes you want the month to month because if you're going to do a value add, they're out next month, you can dive in there and start doing all the repair work. So that might be an advantage, but you really want to have some type of stipulation in there saying if these are, you know, your leases that I'm actually collecting the rent, you need to look at what the bank, what the bank statements say as far as how much money is going in every month, making sure that there's money going in every month. There's not much you could have done with the, uh, with the tenants, uh, leaving. What, what, what do you think you could have done to, to avoid that situation? Yeah. I mean, so they were month to month tenants. Um, mm-hmm. you know, th- I was like, what are the chances that they're going to move out in December? But what happened was I didn't do an actual lease audit, but we did, uh, we put out a stop letters mm-hmm. and, I think because 
I, I honestly think the seller was lying about the rents. Um, I asked my lawyer if we could look at his, have him send over the bank statements. And he said, on a deal this small, probably not. Uh, he doesn't have to do it. Um, so he said, but we can put out a stop of letters, have the tenants sign that this is what they're paying in rent. And they signed them. I mean, I didn't get the letters till closing. And at that point they had already left. So uh, it could have been a situation where he said, sign this paper and get the hell out. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the situation was, but you know, the way I look at it is, you know, I'm kind of glad this happened because I am now able to turn the units around, raise the rents um, and, you know, really start you know, stabilizing this property the way I want to. I love that. Um, and at the same time, it's, you know, December 1st, people move out. I close December 5th. We're going into the holidays. No mm. one's moving. You're going into January, February. It's freezing. It's snowing. No one's moving, right? Mm. So you're talking three months of lost rent that I'll never get back. But, you know, again, another learning lesson. Mm -hmm. So what I love about that, Steve, is uh, you're, you're going through it. You have, an, you have an opportunity out of a problem, right? Most of us would see the problem and say, that's a big problem. But you're, you have an opportunity, actually, because they're actually out. They're going to be crappy tenants anyway to begin with. So the fact that they're out and you're able to work on, the, uh, on those units is really important. And I think everybody out there who's listening, when you say to yourself, what are the chances? Steve has said that a couple of times, and the chances are that it's not going to work for you. So you, you, you're always trying to mitigate risk. You're always trying to, down, down, you're always trying to limit your downside risk. And the, the, what you're going to do diligence, those are really two important words because as beginning investors, especially myself, I struggled mightily when I did due diligence. I didn't know what to do during my due diligence, what to look for, what not to look for. I would have hounded that seller for some type of bank statements. I would have said, yes, I want to see what you're collecting because if you're giving me a rent roll and you're signing this rent roll, I want to make sure that it's matching on. And, and I, would, I would have pushed my attorney for that. As a beginning investor, you're buying your first or second deal. Maybe you feel a little, I don't want to say threatened, but hey, I'm going to listen to my attorney. Next deal, Steve, you make sure I want to see the bank statements because you're telling me that I'm making 9,600 bucks a month. Where is that? Because that's a retradable offense. If all of a sudden I'm getting 9,600, but you're only showing me 7,200, there's something wrong with that. I'm not asking for 300 grand off the price, but hey, we have to figure this out or work this out, correct? So um, give me some other pain or actually give me some pleasure. Well, what, do you, what do you like about the deal? Um, so it's in a... It's in an up and coming area. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's right. So the area that it's in is, is the least desirable area of the, the city, but it's right on the edge where, you know, gentrification starts. So mm -hmm. this area is you step out, out of the building and you're right on the main drag of the city where it's a pretty popular area. It's right mm -hmm. next to the train. It's right next to the water. It's right next to a bunch of colleges, hospitals. So it's a good location. Um, it's, it's improving every day. Um, the, the property appraised a lot higher than what I paid for it. So I kind of already had a, a pretty good head start there. Mm -hmm. um, I, f I ended up filling two of the units uh, by February and March and the beginning of March. So I had that one vac uh, one vacant apartment left, which was the daycare, which was trash. So that is actually, I think has one more week left of renovations. We, I mean, we turned the unit over, but it, we had to put a lot of money into it because it was trashed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, new floors, new, you know, paint, new kitchen, pretty much new bathroom, new everything because mm -hmm. you, just, you couldn't rent it the way it was. Even if you just cleaned it, it just, it needed a, a full rehab. So mm -hmm. I'm excited to get that unit filled, um, raise the rents there. I'm able to raise the rents on a few of the other apartments in the next six months. And uh, I mean, I might be ready to refi by next, you know, by December within a year. So we'll, uh, I'll be able to pull some money up, maybe my entire down payment back out and, and just do it again. That is music to my ears. That's what I like to hear, right? So a little bit of cockroaches, some leaky roof, you're going to deal with it. But if you can get that money out, you control the asset, you're probably going to cost segregate this thing, get some tax benefits from it. So there's a lot of good. And so there's always good and bad involved. Josh, what do you want to ask questions? I see you're dying to ask some questions there. So yeah. yeah. So all right, let, let's look at this picture from the, the big picture overview. So Steve committed. He failed forward got educated. And although he encountered these pain points, when you're talking about them, it's like, it seems bleak. The roof's leaking, tenants are moving out, a unit's destroyed. Still, with the fear, he made it through. He strengthened the muscles, learned from his hard work, and he's going to be able to refi the property. But guess what? You're better prepared now. 
you encounter a problem like that, Steve, you know what to do. It's not a big deal anymore. You realize you've made it through this. So that's what I like about this. And the story has a happy ending. That's great. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Gino and I are super excited to tell you about the audiobook version of The Honeybee, which was recently released. The Honeybee tells the story of Noah, a disappointed, disaffected salesman who feels like his life is going nowhere until the day he has a chance encounter with a man named Tom Barnum, the beekeeper. In his charming, down-home way, Tom, the bee man, teaches Noah and his wife, Emma, how to grow their personal wealth using the lessons he learned from his beekeeping passion. In the audio version, Gino and I sat down for an exclusive interview after each chapter where we elaborate on the stings we felt throughout the business, the importance of scaling up, and how we've been able to create multiple streams of revenue. For more information and to get your copy of the audiobook, visit jakeandgino.com forward slash honeybee. All right, Steve, I got some short answer questions here for you. So I, I want to know real quick what, you know, you, you mentioned your goal is to scale up your business. What do you see as your next steps? Talk to me about where you see your, your business going next. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, now that I've, I've met these guys in the community that we're going to tour some properties and, and look at a couple of markets, you know, the goal would be to, to partner up on a deal with them um, or even, uh, partner up on a deal, another deal around here. You know, I actually like the Boston market. Yeah, it's expensive. Cap rates are low, but the, uh, the rents are relative, you know, they're, the rents are high. Now, if there's a correction, yeah, that might affect things. But during the last recession, I mean, property values dropped around here, but rents didn't move, you know, they, mm -hmm. they plateaued. Um, so, you know, th these areas, they're, they're tricky, but they work. I mean, I have, of tons of family members that were um, investors, you know, during the last collapse and not, they, they didn't feel it at all, you know, and it's because they're in this area. But that being said, you know, so I, yeah, the next step would just be more units, you know, 12 to 24 um, on my own or more with, with other people. Um, so mm -hmm. I love, love that. that. All right. I so see you got a bunch of books behind you. What's your favorite book you've ever uh, read and why? You know, I always said if I, if I was to get on a podcast, I wouldn't say this book, but you know, it is the book that changed everything and it's got to be rich dad, poor dad. You know, I mean, that's the book that you hear people mention all the time. And when I finally read it, that's when everything clicked. And that was the, the, the complete mindset shift into a completely different life. Mm -hmm. um, if that's a cop out, I could go with, uh, I, I liked, um, Ken McElroy's ABCs of real estate investing. I mm -hmm. like crushing it. Brian Murray. Um, geez, there's so many, there's so many good books. It's hard to choose. You know, mm -hmm. I like Ken McElroy. He's an excellent book for anybody out there who wants to really get into the beginning phases. I love it. He talks about due diligence in there. He talks about raising NOI in there. It's just a great book. I totally agree with you, Steve. I love that book. And uh, even the Willpower, the Willpower Profits book, I mean, that book had a lot of stuff in it that most books didn't. I mean, between mm -hmm. the cost segregation, the rubs, that stuff you don't see in a lot of other books. So I mm -hmm. thought that was uh, pretty good also. And, and The Honeybee, I'm not just saying it. I just read that like two weeks ago. And it, it's, I think it's the first like business, uh, what, what is that called? Uh, parable. 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 I was going to say paradigm. Business parable <laughs> that I read. And, I liked it a lot, you know, so good job with that. One. So Steve, what's, what's weird about it when I, as you're saying the honeybee and I'm thinking about your family, if your family had said who, instead of how, could you imagine how many units your, your parents would have had? Your dad would have owned half of Boston because he's, he's running around managing properties. He's fixing toys and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Cause he's still living a comfortable life, but he was more of the mom and pop. Like my dad was instead of, he was working, you know, in the business, not on the business. So the, if he'd read the honeybee 30 years ago, he'd be like, wow, okay, let me partner up with a property manager and maybe I can continue to buy these units. Could you imagine how many hundreds and hundreds of units he would have had if he adopted some of these principles? So, I mean, it's never too late. Uh, but I think it's really a mind shift and th really thinking about growing a business and not just worrying about landlording. That's one of the components, right? The three propriety, three step proprietary framework is the buy right, the manage right and the finance right. But manage right can be self-management or you can get third party management. You can get people to help you or you can hire people 
to manage those properties for you and create a business. So I think there's a lot of relevance and I think it's funny how successful your family has been, but could you imagine if they had adopted the, the, the honeybee principles? Wow. I know it's funny. Cause you know, when I tell him I hired property manager for the six unit, he's like, what are you crazy? They're going to rob you. So he still has that <laughs> mentality of uh, everyone's out to get them. You know? so, <laughs> but I luckily, feel your pain. Yeah. Luckily he's not managing the properties himself anymore, but, um, I think, I mean, my, they just have handymen that they call and that they take care of everything. But, mm -hmm. you know, I tell them, I'm like, you're sitting on so much equity on all these properties, do something with it. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, I'm 65 years old. What am I gonna, who's going to give me a 30 year mortgage, this and that, you know? So he's fine. I think he's ready to sell it all. And, you know, <laughs> he's ready to pack it in my friend. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Love that. All right, Steve, what about your best habit for success? Um, you know, I'm really lately, it's just the past couple of months, I've just been strict with the routine. You know, I get up 530 every morning, uh, two hours before the rest of the house, or at least before the kids. Um, and it's just my time to get stuff done. You know, I, I have a routine where I meditate, I read, uh, I write down my goals. Uh, I respond to email, you know, I get everything out of the way the first two hours in the morning, because once those kids wake up, it is just a hurricane from, you know, 8 a.m., whatever time, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., you know, because they're up late every night. They don't go to bed. Uh, so if I'm not, you know, and at that point, I'm tired. I can't do anything. So if I don't get up in the morning to do it, I, I'm, it's not getting done. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been very helpful uh, for me. And, um, yeah. Love it. All right. So there have been a ton of golden nuggets in this show. I want to go through a few of them and Gino, I know you're going to add a bunch to it. So the first one is your net work is your net worth. So we've got a lot of examples of this one. So Steve, his first job, he found it through his roommate's girlfriend in the TV industry. And then in the Academy, the World Profits Academy, he's able to find partners, like-minded individuals that are looking to scale up as well. Um, the next one is the dynamic of saving your way to wealth versus investing your way to wealth. You want to look at it, you can only trade so many hours per week towards work, but you can have unlimited capital out there working for you independent of your time. So there's a great, great benefit to doing that. Um, and then stepping outside your comfort zone. So first making the, the commitment and the decision that this is what you want to do and following it up with action. And that's what's going to truly help you fail forward and learn and through that is what we call growth and, and as long as you don't make the same mistakes twice you're, you're going to be in a better position gino what do you have to add to this well josh what i like what steve said about money it's only money and everyone focuses on the fear of losing rather than the possibility of gaining so if you're afraid of losing money more than gaining money, you're never going to take action. So you say to yourself, even if I lose a few bucks now, in the long run, I'm going to learn from the experience. I'm going to be able to grow. And the fact that Steve lost a couple months rent, he had some heartache. There's a, you know, I guess a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow with the refined roll strategy where he's gonna be able to pull his money out and he's gonna be able to get paid and, and he's gonna be able to have cost segregation. <clears throat> I think a big learning lesson for everyone listening to this podcast is have your due diligence game on. Make sure you go through that inspection, inspect every single unit. If the unit's down, get some money from that, from that unit, possibly from the seller. If you can do a lease audit, make sure all the money's coming in for the rents. That's really important. Um, and ultimately, I see that Steve writes his goals. Focus on your goals. Focus on what you want. And then obviously, <clears throat> get out of your comfort zone and start and continue to grow with your life. I love that. Steve, anything else to add to it? Uh, yeah, just, you know, you just got to commit. You know, I, people in the, whether they're in the community or just getting started in real estate now, just make a commitment, take action. <clears throat> I promise it's not so scary. If I can do it, anybody can do it. You know, and you hear people say that all the time, but you know, I'm just, I, I was a terrible student in school. I failed out of my first college. Like, you know, I, I have no business uh, being a real estate investor, but I pulled through and uh, I'm making it happen. So, you know, like I said, if I can do it, so can you. Steve, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Um, you can email me at uh, smetrano uh, at gmail dot com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Steve Matrano or on Facebook, uh, Steve Matrano. That's Matrano, M I T R A N O, Mitrano. Good right. Italian name, like it. 
All right, Steve, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest on, on Movers and Shakers and sharing your story. Now, if you want to be the next Movers and Shakers guest, email me, josh at jakeandgenar.com. And if you love the show, please give us a review. And until next time, let's make it a Movers and Shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.